It's so very good to see everyone this morning. Appreciate all the visitors who have come to be with us today. I invite you to take a Bible and follow along as we study from the Word of God. If there's any questions you have, feel, feel free to ask. And we will be happy to talk to you about anything that we say or do here. If you will, open to number, or rather to Psalm 19. Psalm 19. We want to begin our lesson here, a lesson titled Astronomy. In Psalm chapter, or rather Psalm 19, verses 1 through 6, the psalmist directs our minds toward the heavens. Psalm 19, verse 1, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows His handiwork. Day unto day utter speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices like a strong man to run his race. Its rising is from one end of heaven and its circuit to the other end and there is nothing hidden from its heat. We understand as the psalmist says here that the heavens declare the glory of God. As we stand here on earth and look into the universe, we cannot help but to be overwhelmed by the greatness, by the vastness, by the beauty that is there. Recently, maybe you saw this picture or maybe a video from the surface of Mars. The Mars Perseverance rover was launched on July 30th, 2020 and landed on Mars on February 18th, 2021, so just a few short weeks ago. And if you've seen these videos, if you've seen the pictures and things like that, it's incredible. At least it's incredible to me. And yes, the, the audio that came with the video, it was wind. <laughs> but it was Martian wind. It's, it's man stepping out and getting at least technology to another planet to where we have a connection to that planet. To me, that is something that is amazing that we can do and that we have achieved as mankind. If you back up to Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 1, the language there as the Word of God opens helps to remind us about the glorious universe in which we live. It says there in Genesis 1 verse 1, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, in the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. So God brings the material universe into existence. He brings the heavens and the earth into existence. He gives light. It goes on in day two and day three to talk about him working on this earth and creating the ferment, the atmosphere, creating the sea, separating the water from the land and creating the plants and various things upon the land. And then if you drop down to Genesis 1 verse 14, it says this. This is day 4 where it says, Then God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. And so it was. As we look out into the universe and we see the stars that are traveling through the universe across our sky at night, it says that these are given for signs and for seasons, for days and years. These are things on which we can depend. Things by which we mark time. Things when we know where the constellations or certain stars or certain planets will be at particular times of the year. The marking of seasons and days and years. 
as Moses recorded here. And then it goes on to say this, Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He also made stars, made the stars. God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the fourth day. So it tells us here on the fourth day that God created the sun. The sun to give us light by day that is brightening our day even now. And to give light by night. He put the moon in orbit around the earth that reflects and gives us light. At various times, there's enough moonlight on the right occasion or the right evenings where we can see outside at night because of the light that it reflects from the sun. And God made that moon to rule the night. And it talks about those great stars. He also made the stars. This picture here, which we'll show a little bit later as well, is a view of the Milky Way galaxy from Australia. I don't know if you've ever been out on a crystal clear, usually winter night. At least that was the way it was for me as a child growing up in Colorado. I could go out very early in the morning to feed the animals. And sometimes I would lay down in the snow and just look up into the heavens and see a sight very similar to that. Being out in the country away from the city lights and seeing all those stars that are out there. God made those stars. God created them and put them in the heavens. In Genesis chapter 15, Genesis chapter 15 in verse 5, as God is speaking to Abram, we better know him as Abraham, and is making promises to him about the fact that he will have descendants. It says in Genesis 15 verse 5, Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. If you see some of the pictures of the heavens, and you think about all the stars that you could see, all the stars that Abraham could see as he stood in that ancient world and looked up, there are millions upon millions of stars and God told Abraham that's how your descendants are going to be. And he's not necessarily pointing forward to his physical descendants, though those would be included, but his spiritual descendants, Abraham. So you think about the great stars that are there and how God used them to teach Abraham a lesson about the promises, the blessings that God would give to him. All of this goes to show the fact that God created the universe. We want to think about some of these things in Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 4 here. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 4. The Hebrew writer makes this note. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. We know that every house, every building had a builder, had an architect, had a creator, if you will. And when we look into the heavens, we need to see and understand that God made all these things. They did not just appear. They did not just happen to come to be. But there is a God who created them, a God who put them there. In the book of Genesis chapter 1, it lays out the six days of creation. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 11, as God is giving the Ten Commandments and telling them to observe the Sabbath and to keep it holy, it says in Exodus 20, verse 11, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the Sabbath. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So Moses here affirms again, that God created all things in six days. And that is so amazing because we look at these things and we see how magnificent they are. And it took God only six days to create everything that we see. All the beauty and all the glory that is out there. For instance, the one that is on the screen now, the 
spiral galaxy. That's just one of many different spiral galaxies and different types of galaxies that are out there in the universe. Or something like this, a remnant of a supernova. Now, I'm not a scientist. I don't claim to be a scientist. I do find this extremely fascinating. But that is supposedly a supernova. So, you think about those things that are out there and how that God created them, the Bible tells us, in six days. And you cannot reconcile what the Bible presents to us with the creation of the universe that it is a young universe, relatively speaking, with the Big Bang Theory and the billions of years that atheistic scientists say it accounts for the existence of this universe. The two cannot be blended together. They cannot be married together. They're opposed to one another. We think about the things that God has created the sun, the moon, the stars, all these wonderful things. If you go to Psalm 33, Psalm 33, and notice here beginning in verse 6 with me. Psalm 33, verse 6. It says, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and all the hosts of them by the breath of His mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deep in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of Him. For He spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. Think about that great creative power of God as He spoke these things into existence. I cannot speak hardly anything into existence. I might be able to speak something and then someone takes action on that. I might be able to ask my son to take out the trash. He takes out the trash. And so there is a task that brings in that <coughs> happens. But I cannot speak anything into existence. I can't speak a microphone into existence. I couldn't speak a pebble into existence. But God spoke, and these things came to be. If you notice Isaiah 40 with me, Isaiah 40, verses 25 and 26. Isaiah 40, verse 25, To whom then will you liken me? Or to whom shall I be equal? Says the Holy One, Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things, who brings out their host by number. He calls them all by name. By the greatness of His might and the strength of His power, not one is missing. Have you ever reflected on that? That God calls the stars by their name? You know, we have a solar system and we've named these various planets in the solar system. Starting with Mercury closest to the sun and going out to Venus. And then, of course, we have Earth. We live on Earth. We have Mars and Jupiter and Saturn and Uranus and Neptune and Pluto. I'm on the camp that says Pluto is still a planet. <laughs> it's all out there. And we named them. There's nine planets that we've named and we've named the sun and there's other stars out there that we've named. But God has named them all. Billions upon billions upon billions of stars that we can see, that we know of. And God calls them all by name. God has brought them all out. And there's not one missing. There's not one of which He is unaware. All. All are there. And you think about the fact that this came about through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The Bible is very explicit about the Son of God and His role in bringing the material universe into existence. In John chapter 1, verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In Colossians chapter 1, Colossians 1 verse 16, a very similar statement. 
For by Him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through Him and for Him. And He is before all things, and in Him all things consist. The Son of God was the agent through which God the Father brought the universe into existence. He brought it into existence and it tells us that the Son of God existed prior to the universe because He created all things, as John said. And not one thing was made that He did not make. So the Son of God was there with God always. And it tells us about the power of Christ and the glory of Christ as we think about these things. Now, these last two pictures here, these are called the pillars of creation. I believe these were named back in the day when it was more acceptable for scientists to come out and to make a statement like that. But the pillars of creation, two different camera types to be able to see the various gases and things that are surrounding it. But I look at these things and I could sit and look at this, literally just stare at it for a very long time because of the beauty, to me at least, that this holds. As you think about God making these things, bringing them into existence. But the reality is all these things are going to come to an end. In Hebrews chapter 1, Hebrews chapter 1, the Hebrew writer puts it like this, quoting from Psalm 102. In Hebrews 1, verses 10 through 12, And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. And they will all grow old like a garment. Like a cloak, you will fold them up and they will be changed. But you are the same and your years will not fail. So the Hebrew writer there, quoting from the psalmist, gives us a poetic description about the end of the universe. And simply really making the point that all those things are out there But they're coming to an end. It's all winding down. It's all going to be taken away. But you, God, will remain. So the temporary nature of this universe compared to the eternal nature of God, Peter is more explicit about the end and when all things are done away. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, he says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, And the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. See, all these things that we look at around us are coming to an end. And... The entire chapter of Second Peter is really devoted to this idea. There are people who stand around and they'll say, well, you know, nothing's ever changed. Nothing's changed. It's all remained the same. You know, in our short lifespan, it pretty well does remain the same. But we're foolish to think because the stars have been here, because we can go back in the ancient history books and we can go back millennia And read about where people see the same stars that we saw who wrote about how the sun comes up in the east and sets in the west, how they wrote about all those things and we say, well, nothing has changed. We're foolish to think that it will never change. The Bible tells us all these things are coming to an end. All that beauty, all that glory of the universe will come to nothing. It will be burned up. The elements will melt with a fervent heat. And so we need to be ready for that day. The universe, as we look at it, declares the glory of God. It also declares the existence of God. A very 
basic point that we are to get out of looking at the heavens. Again, Psalm 19. The psalmist goes through and talks about when we look at the sun, the moon, the stars, all the things that are in the heavens, he says the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows His handiwork. Yes, there is the glory, the beauty, but you know what? They are screaming something even more important at us. God is. God exists. When we see them, we need to not doubt the existence of God. As it talks about day unto day, utter speech, night unto night, reveals knowledge. You look up into the heavens and they are speaking to us. There is nowhere, nowhere that man has walked this earth and now has been into outer space. There's nowhere. This is not seen. This is not known. It's declared to all of humanity as we see different star formations, different gases that come together to make these beautiful images like the Crab Nebula or the Horsehead Nebula. And I just have to confess, I don't see a crab, but I see something beautiful. I don't see a horse head, maybe you do. But that's out there. And it's been there. And we can see it now. With the various technology that we have, it's beautiful and it is amazing to see the stars and the nebulas and all the different galaxies and the constellations. If you go to Job 38. Job 38. The book of Job is such a beautiful book for the lesson that God is teaching Job. Essentially, Job, it's none of your business, trust me. I'm still here. It's not for you to know. And there's so much that is not for us to know. And in Job 38, as the Lord is rebuking Job and his friends. Here's what it says in Job 38. Notice verse 31 beginning. Can you bind the cluster of the Pleiades? Or loose the belt of Orion? Can you bring out Maseroth in its season? Or can you guide the great bear with its cubs? Do you know the ordinance of the heavens? Can you set their dominion over the earth? Joe, what kind of control do you have over those stars out there in the heavens? None. Can you bind the cluster of Pleiades? No. Can you loose the belt of Orion? These are ones that we know, we identify, we recognize. Pleiades and Orion and then the great bear or it's called I think this is the more proper name, Ursa Major. And if you see in its tail and going forward there, that's the Big Dipper, if I understand this correctly. Again, I'm not an astronomer. But those are all up there for us to see. And God is telling Job, Job, look up there and tell me what you can do about them, what you can do with them. Nothing. We stand in awe of God's great power and we are humbled before Him. Again, we look into the heavens. Maybe you've seen something similar to this as we look at the edge, if you will, of the Milky Way galaxy and all the stars that are out there. In Psalm 19, again, in Psalm 19, he talks about the sun like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. He goes from one end of heaven to the other. There's nothing hidden from its heat. This earth is warmed by the sun as it goes across the surface of the earth, as its heat goes across the surface of the earth. When we see these things, therefore, we understand there's no excuse. There's no excuse for any living human being to deny the existence of God. 
In Romans chapter 1, verse 20, he says, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. You see, there are people who sometimes get confused and they wonder, well, how can God hold men responsible for serving Him when maybe they've grown up in a different society with a different culture and different religions? Well, here's the answer. Everybody can know there is a God. Everyone can. And when we look up into the heavens, it should cause us to seek God and to know Him. When we see these things, we are without excuse because they're amazing beauty that we see in the heavens. Screams that there is a God. When we see things like the spiral galaxies or the eclipse, I think several people here witnessed the eclipse from about four years ago. When I saw that eclipse, when it went over, I literally shook and started crying because of the amazing beauty that was there. And that was just for a brief moment. God brought all that into existence. When we see it, we should be reminded of Him and of His great power. Let's go to Psalm 136. Psalm 136. And thinking about what God has created, the amazing power and wonder of it, Psalm 136, verse 5, To Him who by wisdom made the heavens, for His mercy endures forever. The thing I want to key in on to Him who by wisdom made the heavens. Thinking about the power, the intelligence of God. Think about the sun. The sun emits more energy in one second. Now, it's hard for me to grasp this. The sun emits more energy in one second than a hundred billion atomic bombs. When you think about the size comparison of the sun to different planets, I'm going to try to walk through this because I know it's probably small for you, but let's walk through this just a second. Okay, so on the top left, next to number one, you have Mercury, Mars, Venus, and Earth. In two, you have Earth, that little bitty tiny dot. The next to that is Neptune and Uranus, and then Saturn, and then Jupiter. And then you come down to three, Jupiter is that little bitty tiny dot. And then it's Proxima Centauri, if I said that right. Then the Sun. And then Sirius. Then you come over to number four, and Sirius is like a BD next to Pollux and Arcturus. And I always want to say Alderaan on this, but I know it's not Alderaan. It's Aldebaran. And if you have another pronunciation, you know it, let me know. It won't offend me. All right, so then you get down to number five, and the Aldebaran is a BD. Then you have Rigel, and I'm not even going to pronounce this one, and Andres, maybe, and then Betelgeuse. I looked that one up. And Betelgeuse. And then the number six here, Betelgeuse, and you get to Canis Majoris, and then Signy, and then what I call UI Scooty. I don't know if it's Scooty or not, but it sounds good. But think about our sun and how massive it is and it's not even a speck when it comes to this UI Scooty. It's just nothing. So all that is out there in the heavens. And what God 
has made. That is intelligence when we look at what God has created. You think about all the stars that are out there. Again, Psalm 136, beginning in verse 4, it says, To Him who alone does great wonders, for His mercy endures forever. To Him who by wisdom made the heavens, for His mercy endures forever. To Him who laid out the earth above the waters, for His mercy endures forever. To Him who made great lights, for His mercy endures forever. The sun to rule by day, for His mercy endures forever. The moon and the stars to rule by night, for His mercy endures forever. The universe is an amazing and wondrous place. In the research that I did, the universe, the observable universe, so what we can see with all the technology, all the instruments we have, what we can see, the radius, okay, so that means us standing here on planet Earth looking out in one direction, we can see about 46 and a half billion light years. 46 and a half billion light years. That's, again, that's something hard to conceive. If you're traveling at the speed of light, it would take you 46 and a half billion years to get out there to that edge that we can see. So that means the entire thing is 93 billion light years across. So you look one way, then you look the exact opposite way. 93 billion billion years. That's the vastness of the universe. In a book called The Case of the Creator, Robert Collins talks about how gravity is fine-tuned. Thinking still about the intelligence of God, the wisdom of God, the knowledge of God, that gravity is fine-tuned. And he illustrated it like this, that if you took a ruler as wide as the universe, so you stretch it out over 93 billion light years, and you divide it up into one inch increments that represent degrees of gravity across there, said if you change gravity by one inch, life is not possible. So what does that tell us? There is no other explanation for the existence of the universe other than a great and almighty God. took his power, took his wisdom to bring it into existence. Now, what I have on the screen here right now is Zeta Apuichi. <laughs> okay, it's a big star. Right? The, the big bright star kind of toward the middle there. And then you've got the, the green wispy and the red wispy parts. This is taken with a special camera. Okay, you can't see that with just visible light. Okay, it was taken with a special camera to capture what is happening here. Now this star is six times hotter than the sun, eight times wider than the sun, has 20 times the mass of the sun, and is traveling through the universe at 54,000 miles per hour. Now the thing that it's doing with the gas, it's this star it's creating a bow wave in front of it. You know, as a ship goes through the water and there's that wave ahead of it, usually we see it as a V wave going ahead of a, a ship. That star, so massive, so powerful, traveling so fast, that in the gases, it's pushing those gases and creating a bow wave as it goes through the universe. To me, that's stunning. That's amazing to think about that happening. And how did it get there? It was God. God created it. God put it there. God set it all in motion. But you know, as much as we would stand in awe of these things and look at the universe and realize that there is a God, it takes the Word of God to know God. In Psalm 19 again, Psalm 19, there's a second part after the psalmist declares the glory of God as seen in the heavens. In verse 7 beginning, he says this, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. 
The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. If we want to know God, we have to turn to His Word. We have to investigate what He has revealed to us about Himself. What He has said about us in our condition of all falling short of the glory of God because of our sin and how we have violated His will. We've lived in rebellion toward Him and the redemption that we need and we can have through His Son, Jesus Christ. I'm going to skip ahead here. Psalm 8. In Psalm 8, let's read verses 3 through 6. When we think about this universe, its vastness. In Psalm 8, verse 3, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you visit him? For you made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. You know, when we look out into that universe that has all those wonders, we have to question or wonder as the psalmist did here now look at all this what is man who am I and God gives an answer to that in his word who you are who I am who humanity is we are the crowning point the jewel of God's creation. That's who we are. He's given us dominion over these things. Even if you back up and think about the fact that we've gone to Mars and we've sent spacecraft out further, but we're actually there and there's talk of colonizing Mars, of sending people to Mars. I don't know if we'll ever get to that point. I know we won't ever explore the whole universe. I know that. I'm 100% confident in that. I'd be glad to be corrected on the Day of Judgment if we <laughs> live that long. But there's no way anybody's ever going to go 46 million light years even if the universe stops there. And I don't think it does. But when we look at all that creation, why was it put here? It's for us. God didn't need to create this for His own entertainment and amusement. He created it for us to behold, to stand in awe and wonder. We are God's greatest concern. We are the center of His universe, if you will. Man is the creation that God plans to deliver into eternity with Him. As we studied a while ago, all that we see around us, it's going to burn up, it'll be gone. But we will still exist. God has made a plan for us to be with Him 
for all eternity. He sent His Son so that that is possible. And He offers us salvation. He will open number 830. 830. So I want to close with asking you, do you believe God exists? And if you believe that God exists from all the evidence that is given, have you looked into His Word to see what it is that He would have you to do that you may have fellowship with Him and have everlasting life? Do you have that curiosity? Do you have that drive? Do you have that desire to know God, the God who created the heavens and the earth, the God who gave you life, the God who sent His Son, the God that will bring all things to an end and before whom we will stand in the day of judgment? Do you know Him? Do you know His Son? If you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and you're ready to make a change in your life, to repent of your sin and put that out of your life, you're not ashamed to confess Him before men, and you would be baptized to have your sins washed away. We invite you to do that today. If you're a child of God, you've already done those things. You've already turned to the Lord, but through life, trials, hardships, temptations, you've turned from Him, you lost faith in Him, you drifted away from Him. Then won't you repent of that today? Draw close to Him. If there are things that you need to confess, then confess them today. And rejoice in the mercy that the Lord will extend to you. We invite you to come now while we stand and sing.